ಕಂಸಚಾಣೋರಮರ್ದನಂ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದಂ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ವಿ ವೇರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಇಫ್ ಐ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ವಿ ವೇರ್ we had just the 42nd verse to finish the last one verse number 42 tasmad agyana sambhutam ritstham gyana sinatmanah chitvainam samshayam yogam atishtha uttishtha bharata therefore o descendant of bharata destroying this doubt born of ignorance of the self and seated in the heart with the sword of knowledge take to yoga and arise um he says this uh, ignorance ignorance of what ignorance of our real nature that's at the root of samsara and that's that's in the heart that's in the heart means that's uh, that's in our minds our antakarana that is at the root of the antakarana itself of the mind um destroy it with the with the sword of knowledge you cut it with the sword of knowledge knowledge destroys ignorance and then yoga matishta take to yoga practice yoga and he says exhorting him uttishta be up and doing so that is the um, the upanishadic uh, you know the uh, uttishtata jagrata prapya varan nibodhata so uh, swami vivekananda ad- adapted it the original meaning is arise awake approach the masters of vedanta learn from them you know and become enlightened so swami vivekananda adapted it very uh, inspiringly arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached uh, here it, you can interpret it in two ways one is of course take up the sword of knowledge what knowledge vedantic knowledge self knowledge and destroy the uh, ignorance about the self and that is the practice take to yoga means take to gyana yoga shravana manana nididhyasana and be up and doing uh, come to class uttishta means that means come to class <laughs> and listen carefully and uh, reason it out and then meditate on what you have learned but also let us remember the context the context was arjuna wanted to know this uh, synthesis of karma yoga and gyana yoga what does karma yoga do and what does gyana yoga do um, how to be enlightened and be in the world at the same time remember krishna told him to become enlightened and told him about karma yoga and then how to practice both of them together in in life in this life itself so there it it might mean chitvainam samshayam this doubt uh, about the practice itself should i do karma yoga should i do gyana yoga should i leave the battlefield give up this doubt uh, practice then yoga matishta means practice karma yoga convert you you act in life you fight the battle of life convert your activities into spiritual practice Uh, that is uh, that is what he means by yoga matishta to take to yoga means take to karma yoga here so that's the second interpretation uttishta be up and doing uh, take to action so that is the final verse of the fort, uh, of the fourth chapter 42nd verse he concludes the whole section he starts with tasmat therefore therefore means all of what went on before that the 41 verses and which is why i left it to this day to to take a look back and revise what we have done so there this is something called the um, singhavalokana nyaya uh, singhavalokana nyaya means the example the analogy of a it seems a lion when it walks royally majestically through the forests as it goes a certain distance it stops and it majestically looks over its shoulder at the distance it has traversed so far so this is called singhavalokana the lion looking back at the distance traversed so we are now the lion looking back at the distance <laughs> traversed so far um 
फोर्थ चैप्टर द चैप्टर इज कॉल्ड ज्ञान कर्म संन्यास योग कर्म संन्यास ट्रांसेंडेंस ऑफ एक्शन रिनाउंसिएशन ऑफ एक्शन थ्रू नॉलेज दिस इज कॉल्ड ज्ञान कर्म संन्यास योग सो वॉट्स देयर इन दिस चैप्टर द फर्स्ट थिंग विच स्ट्राइक्स एस इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सेक्शन द वेरी बिगिनिंग विच टॉक्स अबाउट इंट्रोड्यूस इज द अवतार इनकारनेशन ऑफ गॉड सो हियर फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम फुल ब्लोन कृष्ण एडमिट्स declares himself to be an avatar incarnation of god i'm not just uh, uh, your charioteer i'm not just your friend i'm not just uh, a coward boy from uh, vrindavan i'm not just the king of uh, dwarka but i'm actually the incarnation of of god i am vishnu the lord of the universe come in this human form i am an incarnation which comes from time to time the occasion was when he talked about the uh, yoga which is teaching gyana yoga and karma yoga to arjuna and then he said that i have taught this to um, ikshvaku i have taught it to to manu i have taught it to uh, vivaswan the sun god arjuna says hey wait a minute all of them lived thousands tens of thousands maybe millions of years ago how could you teach them you who are teaching me you are my contemporary and then krishna admits that i am but i was also there at that time and i remember all of that all of those births because i am not an uh, a jeeva a sentient being like you or like all of these people i am none other than the um, than saguna brahman or ishwara god now we know these definitions it's so, so important to know these definitions today a young man called from uh, texas and he's desperate i have this one just one question what is that what is the difference between brahman and ishvara you should come to the uh, vedanta sara class so i think he's going to come from next class onwards so so uh, i am the incarnation of saguna brahman ishvara and um, what is that what is an incarnation and sri krishna explains there in a few verses some of which are very famous in fact hindus who study the bhagavad gita they in fact know if they know any verse at all it will probably be one or two of these verses in this book in this chapter what does he say i am different from all of you how am i different avatar and jeeva how are they different their sources are different they come for uh, in a, in a different um, from a different source their nature is different and their purpose is different the sources are different means where do we come from we are sentient beings over countless lives we have accumulated karma a lot of karma we have accumulated and a result is that a part of that karma is actualized in each birth and we get a particular body which will live for a particular period of time which will have certain parents certain experiences to have the results of those karmas we are ignorant of our real nature as brahman that i am brahman we don't know that from lifetime to lifetime we are wandering from from um, across lifetimes trying to get satisfaction peace joy and thereby accumulating karma so and being born again and again avidya kama karma shankaracharya is very powerful phrase avidya ignorance we are ignorant of our real nature then kama comes desire for fulfillment and then uh, karma we act for our own fulfillment that leads to results and those results we own those results we own the action and we own the result and therefore we are born again and again to experience the results of those actions and along the way we accumulate fresh karma and so this is an endless chain it goes on our source is ignorance of our real nature just in contrast uh, the avatar is fully enlightened avatar is none other than god and god is fully saguna brahman ishwar is fully enlightened ishwar knows that i this cosmic person i am none other than nirguna brahman with the power of maya i nirguna brahman appear as saguna brahman as ishwara and i am the creator preserver and destroyer of this of this cosmos this is clear omniscient omnipotent omnipresent this this uh, powers of god the avatar is fully aware of these things is is uh, um it born from knowledge we are born from ignorance we are born helplessly avatar is born out of a choice avatar is born in freedom we are born in 
slavery. We are, we are born in, uh, with no freedom. We are born helplessly so. We have no choice. Nobody asked us, do you want to be born? Do you want to be born in this country? Do you want to be, <laughs> have these parents? Do you want to have these experiences? No, we have no choice in the matter. It is, a, it is action and consequence. We have consequences of past actions of many lives. Avatara has no burden of karma. So Avatara is born in freedom. Avatara is born in knowledge. We are born no freedom and in ignorance. Um, does the Avatara know all this? One question might arise. The traditional view, uh, especially in Vaishnava, where, where the Avatara theory is most developed in Vaishnavism, the 10 avatars of Vishnu and many more, Asankhya avatara, uh, endless number of avatars they talked about. So this avatara, are they aware? They may know that I am Brahman, but are they aware of uh, that they are God and they have uh, past lives and many, many past uh, avatars? All these things are they aware of all the time? The traditional idea in Vaishnavism is yes. From birth itself, the avatar is fully aware of all these things. Only may pretend not to be for the sake of fulfilling their mission in life, the drama they play for us. And uh, so this is the traditional view. And in the, among the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, we see Swami Ramakrishna Anandaji, Shashi Maharaj, who was very de- the most probably the one-pointed devotion to Sri Ramakrishna and Sri Ramakrishna alone. He had this traditional view. He writes about that the avatar is fully aware of his magnificence and glory and the divine origin. On the other hand, Swami Saradanandaji, who wrote The Great Master, he has a unique take on it. He says the avatar is Naradeva, is a, a human being, is a sentient being like us, but also unlike us. So Deva means a divine as well as human. It's a paradoxical thing. It's not entirely divine. It's not entirely a, a drama, a theatrical performance. The avatar may, come, may be unaware of his or her uh, actual source for some time and may come to realize it in the course of the lifetime of the avatar. And uh, so it's, it's not that the avatar is acting. When Sri Ramakrishna is crying and weeping for mother Kali and wants to realize, the, have a vision of Kali, he's not pretending. So if you look at the, the life of Sri Ramakrishna, when he talks about there are two in this body, so that is the Naradeva, two sides of, of uh, um, of the avatar. At many times he behaves like a human being, an extraordinary human being, but a human being nevertheless. And many people around him, they don't even think that he's God. They might find him strange, eccentric, mad, or ex- extraordinary, whatever it is. Um, I remember there was Professor Hawley here from Columbia University a few years ago. He gave a nice speech on, um, I think, popular Hinduism. And then we were talking about you know, in, in Christianity, in modern studies of Christianity, um, this is a problem because um, um, modern biblical studies, they say that the Gospels in the, in the Bible, the four Gospels are there. The first three, John is a later Gospel, but the first three, they're called synoptic, seen together. They do not mention the divinity of Christ, that Christ is God or the Son of God. It all comes later. And so modern scholars immediately, you know what they will say. This was introduced later. When he was uh, simply in in Palestine in his lifetime, he was seen as a simple person. He did not think of himself as a a son of God. And these things were introduced later. I said, it's a very difficult situation then. If you are a believing Christian, what will you say? That uh, Christ, the son of God, but not actually so. Please see the footnote. No, you can't do that. Then I said, what is the solution to this? I said, they actually study the life of an avatar um, who is a recent avatar. And look, the solution is there in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna himself embodies a human aspect and a divine aspect. It's quite possible. Just like Sri Ramakrishna would say, I am a child of Kali. I'm a devotee of Kali. Uh, I am the lowest of the low. I'm the servant of the servants of God. Don't don't call me avatar. I don't like to be called avatar, guru, uh, none of that. I'm, I'm your servant, he would say. And other, at other times, he also said, he who was Rama, he who was Krishna, is in this body, Rama and Krishna. He, he, he identified himself with, with Kali. Um, and, and he said, actually, in this body dwell two, Kali and the devotee of Kali or the child of Kali. So these two sides are equally there. 
it's quite possible that Jesus really actually said that I am the uh, son of a carpenter. I'm just a simple person. I'm, I'm, uh, I worship our the same as you, the Lord, our father. And also he would have declared himself as the son of God. And both are equally possible for the same Jesus. You see what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So his response was, no, no, no. I mean, his response was completely to dismiss. First of all, you don't regard Ramakrishna as an avatar. And so we can't take all these lessons from him. You know. Well, have it your way. We are too far removed from Christ, actually, to judge these things. And my feeling is, also I saw this at, at Harvard also. My feeling is a lot of the scholarship is done. Uh, we are applying our uh, academic methods, our scholarly tools, and our human intellects to something that uh, far exceeds, far outstrips our understanding. So we, when we try to pull it down to our understanding, we make serious errors. We'll say this was interpolated, uh, interpolated. this is not real, uh, that is uh, uh, false. Uh, it has been imported from some other philosophy. No, may not be. All right, so uh, the avatar, one theory is the avatar is fully aware of its divinity, other theory is no. Avatar uh, is divine, but for a time being may not be aware of the divinity and that will help in a proper Leela. The avatar's body, births are actually different from the sentient being, us. Our bodies are created from our parents' bodies and all of these bodies are made of Panchabhuta, the five Panchabhuta, the five elements. Again, you see how Vedanta Sara helps. We, uh, Akasha, Vayu, Agni, Apa, Prithivi and uh, Pancha, uh, Sukshma Bhuta, the five subtle elements comprise our subtle bodies and the five gross elements, Pancha Mahabhuta. And see again, Vedanta Sara, what is subtle element? What is gross element? The exact connection. All of these things we know because of Vedanta Sara. Uh, the five gross elements are used to make up our physical body. So they are produced like that. From the material, the five elements which are already available in the universe. Obviously, these materials have originally come from Maya. But in the case of avatar, this is the doctrine that the avatar's body is directly, specially produced by Maya. Avatar's body, avatar's subtle body, these are specially produced by Maya. These are not part of the usual uh, bhautika, pancha bhautika jagat, the five elements. This is a special doctrine. The body of the avatar is special. Um, Swami Vivekananda says that there is even a teaching. You should not destroy the body of an avatar which is why they preserved Ramanuja's body. It's still there, it's supposed to be there. It's like more than a thousand years old. Sri Ramanuja's body is preserved in a certain way. It looks like a statue, actually. So Swami Vivekananda says, after the cremation of Sri Ramakrishna, that we have committed a great sin. You should never destroy the body of an avatar. But we had no other way, of course. Um, of course, that's why we keep the relics. We, we keep the relics and worship it. Swami Vivekananda mentions this. In, uh, um, in the inspired talks. Nature, Prakriti, Maya, has two kinds of products. One is the general product of the universe and jivas, us and uh, the universe. So us means our bodies, physical body, subtle body, causal body, thula sharira, sukshma sharira, karana sharira. These are produced by Maya. And the physical universe, which is there all around this universe. These are all the general products of Maya. And then he goes on to say, it has an occasional special, uh, it has a special product. Maya has a special product, which is um, the avatars, the, the, you know, Jesus and Krishna and Buddha. What he means by that, the, uh, the bodies of the avatars, the bodies of the physical body and the subtle body of the avatars are special product of Maya. Um, they are not made of the usual five elements. So this is all part of doctrine. You may say, no, no, that if you do a, spectral analysis of uh, the, uh, or, or do an in-depth molecular analysis of the bodies of avatars. Uh, how, will you find something different? I have no idea, but this is the, uh, the, the doctrine. So basically we are all machine made, you know, the general products and uh, avatars are handcrafted by Maya. Krishna says that in this uh, chapter, he says, I directly assume my form Prakritim um, Avashtabhya by taking um, my using my prakriti directly, I manifest myself. 
it may seem that I'm born, but actually I manifest myself. Then the big difference lies in the purpose. Why are we born and why is God born? Uh, or God appears to be born as an avatar. We are born to exhaust the past karma, the prarabdha karma, which has propelled us into this world. We work it out in our lives and we go from lifetime to lifetime, birth to birth, and to, until we become enlightened. This cycle goes on. Our whole purpose is, as Vivekananda said, the goal is to manifest the divinity already within us. And it may take us many lifetimes until we become enlightened and free of this helpless going, circling around. But the avatar is born in freedom. The purpose of avatar is set out very nicely by Krishna. These are the verses which are most famous in this uh, chapter. Everybody um, knows this. Verse number seven <clears throat> and eight. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham. What is the occasion? What prompts the Navatara to come? Whenever dharma declines and whenever adharma increases, I embody myself forth. Why would God do that? Remember, one of the functions of God is the stability of the universe. Srishti sthiti laya. Not only producing the universe, not only finally dissolving it, but in, in the meantime, for billions of years, the universe and the society and all of that should hum along nicely. Um, which is why I know that the world is not going to end. COVID is not the end of the world. <laughs> the Lord will take care of it. Because one of the purposes of God uh, is to maintain this universe to give us an opportunity, the sentient beings to work out our karma and work towards spirituality, enlightenment. What is the purpose? Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadushkritam dharma sangsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge So these threefold purpose one is most important, Paritranaya Sadhunam, to save the holy, the good people. Vina, second is Vinashaya Dushkritam, to destroy the wicked and Dharma Sangsthapana Arthaya, to re-establish uh, or to validate um, Dharma. What does it mean? On the surface of it, the saving the sadhu, saving the good people, it simply means what we read in all the you know, childhood stories of the Puranas and Ramayana and Mahabharata, the demons are plaguing the, the holy ones and the incarnation comes and shoots the demons you know, uh, with arrows. So uh, saves them from uh, affliction and torment. But the real uh, meaning you see, the deeper meaning is this. We see in the lives of all the incarnations, all the time in the world, whether there are incarnations or not, there will be holy people. There will be saintly people. There will be spiritual seekers. They just need that final help to become enlightened and free. So the avatar's first and foremost purpose is to help the devotees. Really, the Lord comes because those who love the Lord want him to come. He comes first for them, for his lovers. He loves them. He is beloved of them. And that's why he comes. To rescue them from samsara, to give them enlightenment, moksha, that's why he comes. So that is the real meaning of saving the good. Saving the good, good means salvation, freedom, moksha, nirvana, whatever you call it. He can directly give it. And um, you say, but people attain it anyway. Yes, very few. After many lifetimes. But when an avatar comes, it becomes much easier. It becomes much easier. With a little bit of effort, we, most of us, we can, we can get across. Um, the ocean of samsara. We can get liberated in this life itself if we want. I have told that story earlier also. Um, you know, this is a story of Swami Ranganathanandaji, the 13th president of our order, and Swami uh, Nirmuktanandaji, the uh, Upen Maharaj, who was a very senior monk. He was, uh, so when the, I'm talking about the story, he was nearly 100 years old. Now, both were disciples of Swami Shivananda. I spoke about Swami Shivananda in the last uh, talk on Sunday, who was the second president of our order. Ranganathanandaji was his disciple, and Upen Maharaj also was his disciple. Upen Maharaj, we have seen, 
he would go to Swami Ranganathan Ji and he would ask, what will become of me? So he's in his 90s. What will become of me? And I heard Swami Ranganathan Ji told him straight away, this is your last life. And it's quite amazing because you have to repeat it clearly. He was not all that good of hearings. But when um, Upen Maharaj asked, he directly heard and understood immediately and said it in English. This is your last life. I shall come again to do Swamiji's work. He says, Abhranganathanji says about himself, I shall come again to do Swamiji's work. But you don't have to come again. So these three sentences. And I verified it. Um, after Swami Ranganathanji passed away, I had heard this story. You know, stories sometimes get exaggerated. So uh, I saw I saw my, uh, Upen Maharaj sitting on in the temple of the Holy Mother one afternoon. And, uh, I took my I saw my chance opportunity and I went and bowed down to him, and I asked him. I have heard this, Swami. I want to verify it. Did you go to uh, Ranganathanandji, President Maharaj, and say what will happen to me? Before I could say anything more, he completed the whole thing. He said, yes, I did. And then uh, he said to me, Ranganathanji said to me, this is your last life. I shall come again to do Swamiji's work, but you don't have to come again. He like, sort of recited the three last sentences. And interesting, he saw the glory of Ranganathanji in that. He said, look at his attitude. He does not even care for moksha. He wants to serve God. He wants to serve um, Swami Vivekananda. I said, um, well, let that be. But you've got, in Bengali, you said chuti. That means you've, you've got like a permanent vacation. This is the end game for you. He was not particularly impressed. He just said, look at the calmness and the rational approach of the person. He just said, yes, uh, the blessings of Mahapurusha. Mahapurusha Maharaj is the name for Swami Shivananda. Yes, the blessings. Mahapurusha Rashidwad Dakajak. Uh, let, let us see the blessings of a Mahapurusha. Let us see. He's looking forward to it, but he's not particularly uh, the, dancing around that. Now I've got moksha. So uh, on a, a few days later, I was taking him on his um, wheelchair. I still remember um, in front of the main temple of Belurmat. And I asked him, that uh, what about oh so another thing I asked him so is it really true that Swami Ranganathanji will come back and he said again look at the rational and calm response he said he said no that depends on God but what is important is look at the attitude of Swami Ranganathanji we are more excited about these esoteric matters somebody is going to be reborn again how do we know he is not interested in that. He says, what is important is the attitude. This is what we've got to learn. Who will be reborn? Where? Who knows? And that's up to God. Um, then I leaned forward and I, I, I sort of whispered in his, uh, talk, talking in his ears, we were going in front of the temple. I was behind him, uh, wheeling the wheelchair along. And I asked him, well, uh, good for you. What about the rest of us? And I was joking, sort of half joking, but he took it seriously. He pondered for a moment and then he said, this time by the grace of the Holy Mother, most will, um, many will cross over the ocean of samsara. Evar maaj pipai oneke bhavashagot par hai By the grace of the uh, Mother, of the Divine Mother, many will cross over uh, samsara. He didn't even say by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, he said the grace of the Divine Mother, which shows it is actually Vivekananda also says, Avatara is an avatara of Maya. This means consciousness plus Maya. It's a Saguna Brahman. So that is the first duty of the avatara, to give enlightenment, not only to the deserving, of course to the deserving, but even to the less deserving, who might, might be whirled around in this samsara for lifetimes, much, much shorter. Maybe this lifetime, maybe just one more life, and we get uh, the big prize. That help the avatar extends, and we should take it. It's a good time to be born. Uh, spirituality is on the rise again, and it is much more effective now. For, for some time, it will work. And then second the purpose of avatar is destruction of the wicked. Of course, we know, you know from the stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata, and before that, the Puranas, how the different avatars came and killed the demons 
So they're all exciting stories. I think they put to shame modern Hollywood movies with special effects. I think one day Hollywood movies will make um, movies uh, about these things. It's, they're so full of action and uh, spectacular things, you know. But Vinashaya Dushkritam, the deeper meaning is to change the wicked. Ultimately, the wicked also will become enlightened. The wicked will become good and the good will become enlightened. That is the, 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 the flow. So the wicked turn good and the good finally become enlightened. Um, that prayer is there. Dujjana sajjana bhuyat. Sajjana shanti mapnuyat. Shanto mucheta bandhebhya. Muktas chanyan vimochayet. Our prayer is, let the wicked become good. Let the good attain to peace. Let the peaceful attain enlightenment. Let those enlightened enlighten others. What a beautiful pray prayer. You know? So that is the real destruction. It's not destruction of the wicked, but destruction of wickedness, destruction of sin and wickedness and uh, degradation. Today I was reading, um, Swami Shivananda said that Vivekananda used to say with the coming of Sri Ramakrishna, this is the phrase he used, Brahma Kundalini Jake Gachi. This is a rare phrase, which is a tantric phrase. Brahma Kundalini, we know the mystic power, which is within each of us. When we become enlightened, that is uh, awakened. I mean, that is awakened and when it reaches its fruition, we become enlightened. That's the whole spiritual journey in a tantric paradigm, not Vedantic. But this Brahma Kundalini, it's, it's a rare usage. It says it's the spirituality of the universe. So that happens when an avatar comes. Somebody asked, what does it mean? And uh, Swami Shivanandaji said that it just means huge changes will occur. Not only people, we can become spiritual, that's there of course, but huge changes will occur in civilization. Civilization will go to a different level altogether. And this is what has started in the last hundred years. Massive changes, it picks up speed. It may seem chaotic, it may seem terrible. We don't know where it's all going, but it's changing very fast. A new civilization will come in its place. Uh, and this will go on, it will work itself out till the next avatar comes. And you say, that, prove it. Can you write a paper and publish it and proving it? No, I can't. I can't convince uh, academics that this is what has happened. All the changes that... And all historians will, will trace changes back to economic forces, social forces, uh, and uh, the activities of some people. Uh, who nobody will trace it back to this poor, um, insane-seeming Brahmin mystic in Dakshineshwar uh, more than 100 years ago. But Vivekananda said it's because of that. And always it happens. Dharma Sangsthapan Arthaya. Establishment of religion. Religion is always there. What is this? What is there to establish? It is that people lose faith in religion, that it's really so. And then religion the essentials get covered over with, with rituals and practices and customs. Hinduism itself, Swami Vivekananda was harshly critical. The Deshachar Lokachar. Deshachar Lokachar means the local customs, the local rituals, they become all of religion. I'm a good Hindu. That means my little temple and my little practices of my family, that's, that's religion for me. Have you ever read the Upanishads, the Gita? Nobody has in the last seven generations. <laughs> so the essentials of religion become covered over with a mass of unnecessary uh, or, or in, uh, unessential rituals, secondary practices. And so that has to be cleansed. And religion in its um, purity has to be established and demonstrated that it's really so. You can attain samadhi. You can have a vision of God. These are real things. This is not just something mentioned in ancient, half-forgotten books. Then, the next thing, important uh, theme in this uh, chapter is the name of the chapter. Jnana Karma Sanyasa. This requires some explanation. We saw what it means. The traditional idea. Okay, backing up. What is the question here? The question here is, all right, I have heard your Vedantic teachings. I've heard your teachings about Karma Yoga. Now, how can I practice them? How can I synthesize my practical life and my spiritual life? 
ultimately? What is the final the synthesis of these things? How do I lead my life from now on? That's the big question. And the traditional answer was, you can become a monk and become um, a spiritual seeker, dedicated one-pointed spiritual seeker. That's how many traditional religions start. The early Buddhism, the early Jainism, and I'm sure in early Hinduism also, monks will attain enlightenment. Householders will not attain enlightenment. Uh, I mean, for example, in Digambara um, Jainism, for example, the more uh, very uh, rigid, very austere form of Jainism, even now, Enlightenment is reserved for monks. Theravada Buddhism, Nirvana is reserved for monks. You give up all your external activities and you put on, there'll be a formal aspect. You put on a gerwa. In Hinduism, there are actual rituals you go through where you formally give up all your social and religious obligation, even religious obligation. You give them up. You have no more duties. You have no more positions. You, are, you don't have money. You don't have a family. You don't have uh, social duties. Um, and so we didn't even vote. For example, it's only when identity cards became necessary that we began to get voters' ID cards when, when Belurmat. Otherwise, we, we never voted. We never had uh, passports, ID cards, and all. Now it's compulsory in India. Monks found it funny. Why do we need an identity card? Of course, modern society is not designed for um, wandering monks. So you have to have an identity card. Anyway. The idea is you are dedicated uh, in living a, a solitary or a, or a community monastic life, searching for enlightenment. Um, you do not pursue any of the goals of worldly life. You're not pursuing pleasure, family. You're not pursuing money, success, power, none of that. You should actually desist from all of that. And then you sit and meditate, and that is spiritual. That's called spirituality. So that was the idea that was taught. And it was very common. And even now, somehow people think spirituality is for, for monks. If you really want to be spiritual, you have to give up everything up and go and become a monk. That is called sannyasa, giving up uh, worldly activities, karma sannyasa. Sri Krishna, you have to appreciate what a brilliant and powerful insight he's giving. Not only for householders, but for monks also. He's giving a much deeper, much more powerful practice, which makes it possible for householders, people in the world, to be as spiritual as the, the loneliest hermit, hermit sitting in the cave and meditating on God. In the midst of community work, office work, family work, responsibilities. Not only for, for householders, even monks who are in ashramas or in cave, this, this is a deeper idea of spirituality than they were used to. So what is this idea? Jnana karma sannyasa. The transcendence of karma through enlightenment, through knowledge. What is the other way of transcendence is there? The actual giving up of karma. Sannyasa means giving up. So actual giving up of karma, putting on a, a ochre robe, shaving your head and going up to the mountains and living like that till the end of your life and meditating. And there, and That's the actual giving up. You make a separate kind of life. But Sri Krishna says, no, no, no. The spirituality is not about changing your dress. Spirituality is not about changing your way of life also. It's about changing your whole paradigm, your whole attitude to this life. Brahman is everywhere. Isn't there Brahman in a householder as much as in a sannyasi? Isn't Brahman in the house, in the office, as much as in the cave? Of course. So what is this insight? This insight he gives here in this book. So I'm Vivekananda said, and same thing, Swami Vivekananda put in powerful words. He who runs away from life to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave, he has missed the way. He who plunges headlong into the luxuries and vanities of life, he too has missed the way. And that's strange. If you run away from life, you have missed the way. If you plunge into life, you have missed the way. Then what is the way? There are only two options. He says, no. The way is to divinize life itself. It is to see God in those you are, who are around you. You see God in the husband and the wife and in, in the members of your community and all living beings. And it is to worship God in that way, to see God everywhere. Inside, you sit quietly in meditation, you are in the presence of God. Open your eyes, you are in the presence of God all the time. Whether you are doing the so-called spiritual practices of meditation and prayer, there is God. Or 
you're doing the so-called secular activities of driving a car and going to the office, there is God also, or fighting this battle in, in Kurukshetra, there is God also. So this is called Jnana Karma Samucha. How is this possible? How is this at all possible? That's the trick. That's the uh, deep insight. So there are these very powerful verses. This section from verse number 18 up to verse number 24. Is a very powerful section. This section itself is Jnana Karma Sannyasa. What does it mean? Transcendence of karma through knowledge or through enlightenment. Doubt might be, all right, so after enlightenment, you can do this. No, if you have this in, insight, after enlightenment, when this becomes a reality. But if you have this insight, you can practice it even before enlightenment. That can be your mode, your philosophy of spirituality, your justification of what you're doing. That I am in the midst of all activities and yet I am just like a monk. I am a spiritual seeker. You can define yourself as a spiritual seeker. It really is a stunning uh, insight. Huge paradigm shift. If you compare it to early Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism or uh, Jainism or say something like Sankhya Yoga philosophy uh, whether in Hinduism, Buddhism or Jainism, this is a big, big step forward. Um, so this is um, spirituality based on an Advaitic insight. It's not possible without Advaita. So what is the insight? Verse number 18. Karmanya karmaya pashyed akarmani cha karmaya sabuddhiman manusheshu sayukta kritsna karma krit. The one who sees no action in the midst of action. An action in the midst of no action. That person he is wise among all human beings. That person is a yogi. And that person is a doer of all actions. So I will not repeat the, um, the explanation. We went through it in, uh, in detail. It simply means as consciousness, as awareness, you are like the movie screen on which the movie is playing. Whatever is happening on the screen, none of the action actually big, belongs to the screen. A screen is not driving a car or exploding in a volcano or coming as a tsunami wave or whatever is happening in the movie. None of it is happening to the screen. And yet the screen makes it possible. Similarly, you are Satchidananda. All actions of the body and the mind, activities of the body, thoughts and feelings in the mind can go on. They are not your actions. This insight frees you from the effect of actions. That is seeing no action, even when action is going on. And then the ignorant person who is sitting and thinks that I am not acting. I, I, am, I have given up karma. I've given up all worldly activities. I sit quietly in yoga, posture, meditate. That is also action. Why? Because restraining yourself from a particular kind of activity is an activity. As long as I'm identified with the body and the mind, as long as I'm, I think I am this, then anything that I do or do not do is action, is karma. And I'll get the result of that. So this is the great insight which enables a person to be in the midst of the world to accomplish all activities and yet be free of it. It may not be formally a sannyasi, but is a jnana karma sannyasi. A sannyasa, sannyasi by virtue of knowledge, of advaitic knowledge. Actual enlightenment, of course. But even before that, one can take up this philosophy and practice in this, this paradigm, take up the paradigm. This uh, And the next few verses show that this applies equally to um, sannyasis. Monks can apply this and householders can also apply this. And actually our whole Ramakrishna mission and all it's possible because of this. Otherwise, why are you monks running hospitals and schools and um, um, relief centers and you should meditate. If there's an earthquake or a, or a famine or a flood, you run to help people. Why are you not meditating? <laughs> so that is the old idea of being a monk. And Swami Vivekananda had to face it. Swami Akhandananda had to face it. Pramodadas Mitra, who was a great scholar in Banaras, he writes strong letters you know, criticizing Vivekananda starting all these schools, colleges, hospitals, and uh, you know, activities to do good to society. He says, this does not befit you. You are monks. You beg for your food. You sit and meditate. And at the most, you can teach others. But this is not the work of a monk. 
and, you know, taking care of poor people, sick people, uh, teaching children. So Vivekananda, he, um, he, he gave fiery replies. He says, even according to your Advaita, Advaita, Atman is ever free. So why are you doing any sadhana for the freedom of the Atman? And if, if that can lead you to freedom, this also can lead you to freedom. But you need the philosophy behind it. The philosophy is this one. Jnana Karma Sanyasa. And then it ends on the 24th verse with a grand conclusion. Again, a very famous verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi Brahma Gno Brahma Nahutam Brahma Evate Nagantabhyam Brahma Karma Samadhina So the paradigm is of a Vedic fire sacrifice. The ladle by which you offer uh, the offerings in the fire, that is Brahman. Um, The fire itself is Brahman. Um, The one who is offering is Brahman. The offering which you put in there is Brahman. And if one converts one all activities that you see Brahman in every action, not only the action itself, the one who is performing the action, the instruments with which you perform the action, the objects with which you perform the action, those for you whom you perform the action, whatever action it is. If you see God everywhere in this way, if you connect God to all aspects of action, you will realize God. You will attain to God. Attain to Brahman means you will actually, technically it means you will get self-realization. Aham Brahmasmi. In fact, this is a term, Brahma Karma Samadhi. It means the person, the person who sees in this way, who has accepted this format. Totally applicable to a person who's working, say, in a job or having a family. Completely so. Remember, who is teaching to whom? Krishna, a householder, is teaching to Arjuna, a householder, in the middle of the battlefield. Not the slightest sign of the Himalayas or the ashram or Vedanta society. They're nothing in the midst of tremendous action. Then, in the next few verses... He gives a series of other practices. He uses the same format of a Vedic fire sacrifice, yajna, a lot of other practices. Um, the traditional fire sacrifice itself, daiva meva apare yajnam, um, the knowledge sacrifice which was just mentioned here, Brahmarpanam is a knowledge sacrifice. It's the practice of um, that seeing God everywhere. But also other, other interesting practices, for example, control of the senses another kind of uh, sacrifice uh, or a fire sacrifice. A fire sacrifice is just a format, paradigm. Um, then considering the senses themselves to be the fire, fire into which we are putting offerings. So eyes are a kind of fire into which you are pouring offerings of uh, forms. Ears are the fire into which you are pouring offerings of sound. A tongue is the fire into which you are pouring offerings of food. So you convert all of it into a uh, ritual. Um, then pranayama, control of the, pra- of the breath control, pranayama, that's one kind of um, so sacrifice. Giving in charity, um, the s- chanting of the Vedas, the study of the scriptures, these are all practices. For having vows like fasting, not speaking for some time, all these kinds of vows, all of these he mentions, I think it's a list of 12. And then finally he says, the whole point of all of these practices is, is that practice. Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi. The knowledge practice, the Advaitic paradigm, that is the point of all of these practices. Ultimately, all Karma Yoga, all Bhakti Yoga, all Dhyana Yoga, they all must culminate in enlightenment. Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is the final thing which leads you to enlightenment. Of course, I'm taking the Advaita paradigm. And the same thing might will be explained by a Bhakti teacher uh, in just the opposite way, as a devotional paradigm. Right. So let me just take the uh, questions or let's see the activity in the chat. Journey to joy. Oh, all right. Some of you were in that other program organized by Princeton. A pretty big program. I think we had about six, nearly 500, 600 people attending and more will be there tomorrow. Actually, this time is early morning in India. So somebody said the sun is just rising. <laughs> so tomorrow, I think we'll have many more participants. Radhanath Swami, who is a very well-known teacher in the ISKCON tradition, 
uh, he has got a book which is very beautiful, Long Journey Home. He's going to speak tomorrow. I'm sure there'll be a huge turnout. They had more than, they had nearly a thousand people registering for that event. It was big. I mean, you had Yale University and Tufts University, uh, their uh, chaplains, and offices of religious life. Good. Poonamji says, Purusha Ruktam, creation of man from the head of God, Brahman, etc. Does this also relate to the prakriti of a person, not the jati as described by Krishna in the 13th chapter? Yes. These, these are qualities of the person, not the by birth um, caste, which has become the caste system in India now. Srinivas says, Lord Ram did not know his self till Yoga Vashishta happened. You, know, I mean, you can see it that way. I said two views of an avatar. An avatar is fully enlightened anyway. Or avatar does not know, it's not enlightened, and he goes through the practices and then becomes enlightened and to show us that it's possible. In the Bible, the John the Baptist in the river, he would baptize people by dunking them in the river Jordan. And he said that somebody is going to come after me who will baptize you with fire. Somebody is going to come after me. That one, that one is coming whose shoelaces I'm not fit to tie. They didn't know what he's talking about. He was the greatest saint in that area. And one day in the long queue of people who are waiting to be baptized, Jesus is standing there. Of course, people don't recognize him. They know he's just the son of a carpenter. John the Baptist looks at him and immediately recognizes. Recognizes what? This is the son of God. It's God. And he says, Lord, I am not fit to baptize you. You should baptize me. And then Jesus says that, let it be so. Let, let the traditions be fulfilled. Which means he, he agrees with John the Baptist. He knows. In that sense, he knows who he is. Girish says, Swamiji, since you're a student of Wittgenstein, how would you interpret the statement? That whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. Okay. <laughs> Difficult. Books and books have been written about this. Easiest for me would be to give a Vedantic reply. But to that would be like too easy. You know, this the ultimate reality is beyond words and beyond conceptions. So we cannot speak of it. We remain silent about it. This is references to Wittgenstein's uh, Logico Tractatus Philosophicus, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, um, the last statement in that book. But what does it actually mean for Wittgenstein? For that, I think it requires a separate lecture. I have to change gears. We'll just leave it at that. My own understanding is you have to see Wittgenstein's worldview, the early Wittgenstein's worldview. And then from that worldview, you have to see why there are certain things which cannot be said. His worldview about atomic facts and these things. And then there are certain things which cannot be expressed. What is the link between atomic facts and language? And therefore, what is it that cannot be said? And so we must talk about remain in silence. So is that no connection with Vedanta? No, that also I will not say. You can, it has nice implications for Vedanta. Leave it at that. Nidjari says, Swamiji does Maya in Vedanta equal to Prakriti. Exactly. The Prakriti of Sankhya was uh, absorbed into Purusha by uh, Vedanta. So Vedanta calls it Brahman and Maya. Maya is nothing apart from Brahman. Nothing can be apart from Brahman. Brahman is existence itself. If something is apart from Brahman, it will become non-existent. You see, logically. So Prakriti, in Sankhya, Prakriti and Purusha, consciousness and matter, they exist. Consciousness and nature, they exist independently. They interact. But the existence of one does not depend on the existence of the other. The purposes of, the, of one depends on the other. But... The existence does not depend on the other. But in the case of Maya, Maya's existence is Brahman. There is no separate existence of Maya. It's like Brahman absorbing Prakriti and calling it Maya. So that's Advaita Vedanta. What would Gaudapada say about the avatar? He would smile. No, not scornfully. Of course, he would recognize the avatar. Um, there are there's a nice thing about Ramachandra facing some rishis in the forest. They recognized who he is. They bowed down to him and they said, 
We know who you are, but for us, you are the son of Dasharat. You are the prince of Ayodhya. That's it. No more. And Ramachandra smiled. He was not annoyed that they refused to accept him as avatar. Their bhava was shanta bhava, the, the peaceful attitude. That is the Advaitic non-dual attitude. And Ramachandra blessed them. He said, be it so. Rama says, yeah, but you remember Gaurapada's verses in the fourth chapter, Upasana Shrito uh, Dharmaha. He talks about those who are, are dualistic by nature. He calls them Kripana, worthy of pity, who are stuck in the dualistic mode of worship. So one has to, if avatar helps you to come to non-duality, that's it. That's the purpose of avatar for Gaurapada. It's good. If not, avatar says, I am the avatar and worship me and take refuge in me. Gaurapada will be, no, 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 that's not the way. Rama. Swamiji, avatars are being, being born out of freedom, not of karma. Why is there suffering in their lives? Uh, Sri Ramakrishna tra- suffering from throat cancer. One is teaching how to transcend suffering, teaching us. Everything that the avatar does is loka shiksha, is an indication as of a deeper spiritual truth to be taught to us. You see, dharma samstapana, establishment of religion, is being done by the life, not only by the teaching. Sri Ram, Swami Vivekananda said, more important is the life of um, Sri Ramakrishna. He lived these teachings. That's the re- establishment of religion. So even that. Also, one more reason is Sri Ramakrishna himself said, the avatar comes to absorb the sins of others. How does the avatar set us free? It cannot wipe out the debts. So avatar, even avatar cannot. But what the avatar can do is take it upon himself or herself. And they suffer in our place. Which is kind of sad for us. We, we shouldn't, we should be careful. The avatar shouldn't uh, uh, take on our burden and then suffer for us. Um, So Sri Ramakrishna, an avatar, he, 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 he said, it is because of such and such sins of those people I helped. That's why this has come to me. Is it true, Rodrigo says, Maharshi Bhigu's curse is the reason of Vishnu's avatars? Well, there's a story in the Puranas. I haven't forgotten exactly what story you're referring to. I have only a vague memory. Rodrigo says, John the Baptist, also son of a barren woman. But blessed... And then uh, he was born yeah. by, the, by, uh, by an angel's blessings, right? As far as I remember from the Bible. Dimitri had a question. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Swamiji. Uh, you mentioned in the earlier uh, lectures about attention. And uh, so I wonder if you could a little bit explore, uh, like elaborate on this. What is attention from the Vedantic perspective? And like what controls the direction uh, of attention and uh, yeah. how does that can be relevant to the work uh, from the Vedantic? Uh, you know, yes, from the Vedantic perspective, uh, I use Vedant in a general sense there. I specifically mentioned yoga, Patanjali yoga. So attention is, see, we have a series of vrittis in the mind. The mind is con- constantly churning away. What is attention? What are those vrittis about? What are the thoughts in my mind about? I have a thought about a pen, I have a thought about the time, I have a thought about the cloth, I have a thought about the computer, pen, thought, uh, time, computer, cloth. These are the objects of my thought. Now, what attention does is it makes sure that the thoughts are about the same object. I'm studying a book. Now, my attention is on the book. It is natural for it to flicker as uh, other impulses, uh, inputs come in from my senses. Or thoughts emerge from my memories. From in, inside something may emerge or some outside some uh, inputs may come in. And the mind flickers. Mind is always flickering. Now the job of attention will be, the job of will will be to bring it back to the object. Is so it the first the, thought is about the book. Yeah. Is it an intellect in the Vedantic paradigm that sort of, and this reflected consciousness in the mind? The is intellect it, helps, it, but, but the, the ego has to do it. The uh-huh. agent. Uh, I will now think about this. I will not think about the other thing. That kartritu, that agentship must be there. Um, so in meditation, 
You stay in the Bhagavad Gita and very interestingly are found in focus. Daniel Goleman's book, there is a section where he talks about the stages of meditation and the neural correlates of that. And he says there are actual networks of neurons which, which correspond to each of the stages. What, is the, what are the stages? First I say I will focus on this, maybe the breath or on a mantra. And there's something, some part of the brain which lights up when you do that. And then comes a distraction. Some other thought comes up. And there's another part where nearby which lights up when that happens. And then comes following the distraction. Uh, uh, unknowing, I mean, sort of we uh, half consciously we slip away into the distraction. Whatever has come up, we start thinking about that and related things. Then comes noticing that we have been distracted. Oh, it all happens in a less than a second, a fraction of a second. Noticing we have been distracted. Oh, this has happened. Another part of the brain apparently lights up there. This noticing is a is a, is a um, function of a set set of neurons. And then he says bringing the attention back to the original object of attention. That means I will think about this only and holding it there. Of another set of neurons fires there. So there he talks about four different sets of neurons which keep lighting up in the four different um, functions, four different stages of meditation. Meditation, distraction, uh, noticing the distraction, coming back again. Four stages. And those four stages, I was amazed to find. When I read it, um, Daniel Goldman is saying, I immediately rushed and picked out sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Talks exactly about the four stages. Meditate. Wandering mind. Notice the wandering. Bring it back. And repeat. Indeed. And then, then does it also mean that the attention is essentially this uh, keep like is a approximation of Brahman, so to say, right? Like because like uh, our ability to notice things, our ability to see and inquire and sort of climb back the ladder, the ladder of like like I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the thoughts, and this ability of attention to you know, to notice that the mind has changed and the mind is running off with, you know, different train of thoughts and then return back. Is that the, I don't know how to express it, is that kind of the gateway or a seed to the Brahman? It is the source for all kinds of meditation, including Vedantic meditation. I'll make a very subtle distinction, a very important distinction. Mm -hmm. It is a form of meditation. It, it, it is the, the structure of meditation whether it is um, your mindfulness meditation or uh, Vedantic meditation or meditation on a deity. It is always the structure will be this. Now, this involves mind and intellect and ego. All of these are involved already. Memory, all of these are involved in med meditation. Um, in fact, a very ancient uh, saying is uh, quoted actually by Vyasa, the, the commentator on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. There is a commentary by Vyasa. The traditional commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is called Vyasa Bhashya. At the very beginning, he says there is a cycle. Things come up. When you're sitting quietly in meditation, you're not looking anywhere, not trying to hear anywhere. Good environment, but then things will bubble up from within. Immediately. Thoughts, feelings, ideas, desires, frustrations, anxieties, they'll bubble up from within. So he says, samskaras keep bubbling up. There are these deep vasanas, conditionings within us. And they emerge as vritti. From, they, are, they are samskaras, conditionings, and they emerge as vrittis, thoughts in the mind. Now, um, whatever you hold on to in the mind, that will color the subconscious. It will color the, the storehouse of samskaras. It will go back and become a samskara again, or strengthen existing samskaras. Now, what do you do? Um, he says, Evam Vritti Samskara Chakram uh, Ahar Nisham Avartate. This cycle, the wheel of Samskara and Vritti rotates day and night, he says. This is a quote. This is the state of our minds. Now, what does meditation do? We have, we have to change the Samskaras, but we have no direct access to them. The only access you have is your conscious thought right now. And that also for a fleeting moment of, you know, like Daniel Goleman would say, notice what's going on. A little window of opportunities there. As the samskaras become thoughts, bubbles coming up, you notice, is this useful? Is this the mantra or something else? No, it's something else. Reject it. Put the mantra in its place. Hold on to the mantra and keep doing it 
this mantra again will go back and uh, will influence the samskaras. Uh, and over time, you will see it will get easier because the samskaras themselves are changing. Thank you. This is what attention does in meditation. But of course, attention is being studied a lot nowadays and uh, for various purposes. And it's, it's the most important thing. I was just thinking, I forgot to mention to Vineet in the, you know, Princeton, where they are, they had the, the, and they still have some of the richest concentration of scientific manpower, uh, scientific human resources that in Institute of Advanced uh, Studies, IAS, in Princeton University. At one time, they had uh, Einstein and uh, Godel and von Neumann um, and others. Um, so I was reading von Neumann. He, um, he was one of the youngest members of the faculty at the Institute of Advanced Studies. I was reading that he was used to be mistaken for a graduate student. He was convinced, in his biography, it said that he was convinced that he could solve any problem by the sheer power of his focus, of his concentration. He had extraordinary powers of concentration. It really shows Vivekananda so long ago, he said the difference between an ordinary person and a great person lies in the degree of concentration. And here's Neumann from his own experiences. He says that uh, uh, it is, I, I credit all my, he had extraordinary mental powers, extraordinary, unmatched. He said, I credit it all to my power of concentration. Yeah, attention is the real wealth. That's why in our uh, uh, Silicon Valley and all, attention economy, what they're trying to grab is our attention. Yes, so thank you very much. Let us end with a chant. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu